Kyle Blush. Uh, I'm Jonathan Gonzalez. And I'm Jason Galba. Uh, we're here in Jason's studio today where uh, Tile Blush has hung the work of Anna Vickers. Uh, this will be part of a, an upcoming pop-up show that we are working on. Uh, will be available uh, by appointment uh, and we hope to see you all here. Um, so today Jason and I are going to be reading excerpts while looking at the work of Anna's from an interview the two of them did in 2017. Uh, the interview was first published as a book, uh, one that Tile Blush will be re-releasing uh, on our design shop coming up shortly, uh, which we're super excited about. So, so the, the conversations you hear today, the information that you hear today, you can find the expounded upon version, the full length version, uh, coming up sh uh, shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, so without further ado, we'll start to look at Anna's work. Okay, so we're going to start with Anna's, um, the earliest work in the show. Um, by Anna. Do you want to introduce the, the painting yeah, titled so Jonathan? This is, this is a painting titled Edge. Uh, the painting is from 2002. Uh, and Jason will speak today in Anna's voice. So, to make a painting means opening up a discourse with a long history. A history in which the theme of beauty was paramount. Since postmodernism, this has been problematized in terms of critical significance. The female nude is arguably the most heavily deconstructed subject throughout the course of art history, and the issue of beauty is embroiled in it. How I draw from the category of the nude is not a strategic move, but this is why it interests me. I'm interested in how Kenneth Clark's category of the nude was challenged by feminist critique, and in the question of how to paint the female nude after this critique. I draw from the nude as a vehicle to question what art cannot be and what this means in relation to contemporary art. So as we look around at the paintings, we'll move around the studio uh, and not chronologically, but move through the work of Anna as we, uh, as we explore everything you guys will be able to see shortly. Uh, the next painting is a painting titled Candy. Uh, it's from 2002. And again, Anna will, uh, will give you, uh, or Jason will give you Anna's, uh, Anna's perspective. I question if feminist critique has set up new parameters surrounding the virtuosity of female painters who engage with the subject of the female nude. If a female artist combines virtuosity with the motif of the female nude in a way that falls outside of established feminist critique, I question if she is susceptible to a similar type of criticism that 18th century female painters received, where displaying their skills was like displaying their bodies. The next painting we're looking at today is called Coming To. Uh, this was a painting from 2015. Uh, and in the interview, Jason asks, in your coming series, stains and glazes of the color yellow evoke urine. They saturate your paintings like light in a Hudson River school painting. The texture and movement of white paint looks like semen. It reminds me of the sea sprays and misty swirls of Turner or beams of light in old master assumption of the Virgin paintings. Anna, why do these elements in your work have a sublime quality? The sublime quality is a way of glorifying the discarded body. And, and what do you mean by the discarded body? It's a term I coined to think through the challenges to painting's history, which include the challenges to the sign relevant to your description and the challenges to the female nude. In a conversation between Hal Foster and Minion Nixon at the ICA London, Foster stated that in the late 1980s, quote, more and more the body returned in art, but a particular body, it was a damaged body. It seemed to come as a figure of a damaged body politic, end quote. The discarded body is concerned with how to paint the body that did not return after the emergence of the body Hal Foster refers to here. And the tour continues. <laughs> the next painting is another painting from the same year, 2015, uh, called Coming One. I'm interested in how the public today would respond to paintings where the subject of the individual, as seen persisting through the challenges toward it, is explicitly at the forefront. From the same year, Coming for. The figure in the painting luxuriate in signs of abjection. They absorb semen like it's skin cream or hair conditioner and urine like it's like they're sunbathing. 
It's like they're being composed from their surrounding. This makes me think of how some of your recent paintings appear to be gestating bodies. The seductive poses of the figures appear fetal. How does this relate to your concept of the discarded body? The nude's death paralleled that of painting, although its death was more definitive. In postmodernism, the body reemerged as abject in works by artists like Paul McCarthy and Cindy Sherman. Bodily waste was an integral part of this abjection. I'm questioning if an abstract concept of the ideal can be constructed with this waste. I'm examining if waste can be factored into figures who see themselves as they imagine themselves to be. Working with Jason on this exhibition, we are interested in looking at paintings in a domestic space. How do these paintings cohabitate with us in our daily lives? I think, I think talking about the humanistic elements of Anna's work is, is kind of paramount uh, in understanding uh, this relationship. And so this is Grey Matter from 2006. I make work as a form of critique that considers what might constitute the social in relation to contemporary art practice. Instead of my paintings remaining silent regarding the problems with their subject matter, they highlight the issues to examine whether there's a critical place for my subject matter to exist in art today. This is a way of determining what contemporary art is through interrogating what it appears it cannot be. This is Grey Matter 4 as well from 2006. I'm interested in to what extent I can extend the canon which includes some of the works that I find the most powerful in art history. Griselda Pollock said that, quote, when I first began tentatively to think feminist difference inside art history, one of my targets was images of women. One of the categories was the female nude, end quote. I'm interested in how I can re-engage with this category after feminist critique has broken it down. And back to 2015 with a painting called, titled, Coming Five. At a time when the term audience and community are paramount to defining the framework of 21st century museums, how do your paintings address the concept of the individual? The figures remain completely composed in the tumultuous, liquid-like gestures surrounding them. Instead of drowning, they're bathing or surfing. Instead of being torpedoed, they balance on a geyser spout, like the figure on top of a trophy. Instead of being thrown about in a washing machine, they go with the flow. Painting from 2003 titled Rush. I take all the qualities that make painting a terrible, reviled thing the subject, the materials, and the techniques to assess the antagonism toward it. I want to contemplate what this antagonism says about the current moment, reflected by what's most embraced by institutions. And from 2003, Evening outing. Authorship in your work is so hypertrophic to the point of self-reflexive. An institute, is institutional critique a factor in your emphasis on the concept of author? Yes. I only use portraits where I feel my image was the most ideal, the most beautiful, and I replicate this body in a never-ending mirror image loop throughout all my work. And the last painting we'll look at today is from 2008. Parade. The colors in the flesh of your figures look drained out, like they've been bled out. What is the relationship between color and flesh in your work? I've always resisted using color to depict flesh naturalistically. I drain the colors, I sand them down, and I peel them away with my nails. I paint the bodies primarily monochrome. When artists use color to paint bodies, those bodies seem closer to life. Stripping away color places my bodies in a more abstract realm. They are further removed from being a person with an identity. They become more like emblems, ciphers, and historical tropes that help me rethink the category of the nude from a contemporary standpoint. So that's it, guys. Thanks uh, to Jason Galvin.
uh, Anna Vickers and all of her thinking and work, beautiful work that she's created. Uh, we hope to see you guys uh, at the upcoming pop-up, uh, exhibiting this work and a few other pieces that, that weren't on the tour today. Uh, but again, thank you all for being here so much. Thank you as well. Thank you so much for, for visiting with us. See you everyone. Bye.